if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mindshot True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And this is the Dr. Jeffrey McDonald series, episode two. Witnesses. Are there more witnesses to individuals leaving McDonald's apartment? Because all the guilters, they like to pretend that nobody else was there and there's zero evidence that anyone was there in the apartment. Now, even if McDonald is guilty, as we outlined in the previous episode, that doesn't mean he acted alone or... Regardless of the extent of the guilt, if he was somehow involved with some kind of individuals, drug, drug-related or otherwise, and there were other people there, is there corroborating evidence that there were other people there that night? Whether or not it was a girl in the floppy hat or not, how much actual evidence is there that other individuals were fleeing the apartment? And we're going to examine all that and more in typical mind shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront. If you want to help support the podcast, find it interesting and informative and keep up awareness in unsolved cases, cold cases, wrongful convictions, and more. You can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Or you can become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons, you get priority for case topic, logical analysis, cool podcast requests. You can also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comments section. Okay, so we have a lot to go over here. Let's set the stage here with more information first. So this is InsideStoryOBS.blogspot.com. Behind the scenes in the Observer's Newsroom, my talk with McDonald during his 1979 trial. And this, about this blog here, I'm Rick Thames, executive editor of the Charlotte Observer. I grew up in Eastern NC and have also worked in papers, Florida, Tennessee, Kansas. At the Observer, I oversee all news, sports, business, and features content, local, state, national, international. I do not supervise your editorial pages. Okay. All right. So, I believe a newspaper can and should be an asset in its communities. It should inform, enlighten, and inspire as it safeguards a free and self-governing society. I love what I do, and I wish the same for you. Okay, so here's a post here from the Charlotte Observer behind-the-scenes blog, whatever you want to call it, insidestoryobs.blogspot.com. Posted Saturday, September 15, 2012, my talk with McDonald during his 1979 trial. I can see how someone coming across the murder trial of former Dr. Jeffrey McDonald 33 years later would think he was wrongly convicted. As a reporter who covered the trial, I watched the case build for and against McDonald day by day for seven weeks inside a rally courtroom. I was a 24-year-old reporter for the Fayetteville Observer, barely a year into my first job as a journalist. My beat was the military, and McDonald, 35, had been a doctor in the Army Special Forces. Fort Bragg was where I reported most of my stories. It was there nine years earlier that McDonald's family had been savagely wiped out in one night. Now, McDonald stood accused of committing that savagery against his own pregnant wife and two small girls. As the jury went into deliberations, the press corps quietly took its own poll. A majority said McDonald would be found guilty. I voted with the minority. It wasn't that I was convinced that McDonald was innocent. I simply doubted that a jury of 12 people could see what I had seen and unanimously agree he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yet they did. They looked right past nagging details that supported McDonald's case and decided that what really mattered was this... He was lying. On Monday, the case gets another airing in a court in Wilmington. McDonald's lawyers say they have fresh evidence and testimony that gives more credence to McDonald's versions of what happened. That version goes like this. McDonald and his family were attacked by two white men, a black man wearing a fatigue jacket, and a blonde-haired woman wearing a floppy hat and carrying what appeared to be a candle. The woman, he said, chanted, quote, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, end quote. 
journalists tend to hang on to their work when they report memorable stories. For me, the McDonald trial was that kind of story. When I heard last week about the new hearing, I dragged a plastic tub from a closet and soon was leafing through dozens of articles I filed over that seven-week period. Reading those yellowed pages, I was reminded how the jury could think the unthinkable. I also found a cassette tape. On it was my one on one interview with McDonald conducted while the trial was underway. I didn't know this in 79, but it was remarkable we were talking at all. The government had begun presenting its case. McDonald decided he could talk because the judge's gag order covered witnesses, but not the prosecution or defense. That's kind of interesting. So there we were, sitting in a pizza restaurant during a lunch recess. The rookie reporter asking questions of a defendant who had been honing his story for nearly a decade. In playing the tape now, I'm reminded of how indignant McDonald was over the idea of a trial. Nine years earlier, the Army had investigated McDonald for the murders and declined to prosecute. And we'll actually be getting into why later in this episode. The latest set of prosecutors, he assured me, would present nothing new from that time. There is no case, McDonald said. They know there is no case. What they are trying to do, they are trying to mound up a pile of stuff and make it look like a good investigation was done. And then in a closing argument, unbetressed with any facts at all, they are going to misinterpret the witness's words you watch. He heaped special scorn on two people he held principally responsible. His stepfather-in-law, Alfred Kassab, whose complaint with the Justice Department was the basis for reopening the case, and Assistant U.S. Attorney Brian Murtaugh, who helped prepare the case for trial. I asked again, are you sure there's nothing new? And then he brought it up. The blue pajama top. McDonald had worn it the night of the murders. He said a government expert had come up with a model of that shirt, which would be shown during the trial. It's something he devised in 74 that he felt added to the case, McDonald said. He didn't seem particularly worked up about this model, and showing my inexperience, I didn't ask him to explain further. But a few weeks later, its significance showed when the former FBI expert Paul Stumbaugh took the stand. Stumbaugh said the shirt had 48 ice pick holes in it, more than four times the number of wounds found on McDonald. None of the holes matched his wounds, but it was possible to fold the shirt in such a way that the holes equaled the 21 ice pick thrusts into the chest of McDonald's wife, Colette. And we actually, I don't know if we spent a lot of time on this regarding the shirt, but I'll, I'll give thoughts on it in a moment. The shirt was found on her chest. McDonald said he only put it there after regaining consciousness and finding her severely wounded. But prosecutors asserted that he stabbed his wife with the ice pick through the pajama, pajama top to simulate an attack on him. I mean, you would think someone with any kind of intelligence wouldn't do this, just like, you know, using whatever materials from within the... I mean, none of it really makes any sense. Again, make sure you check out episode one, because if he is even remotely intelligent, it just seems very strange that he, think, that he could think he could get away with it doing it in this fashion. You know, that that's what really sticks out to me, unless, of course, he was on some kind of drug-induced rage, in which case, of course, I mean, all logic and reason will go out the window. So, under that circumstance, maybe. But process... Okay, so, as the jury deliberated, among the evidence it requested to see again was that blue pajama top, as well as the top Stumbaugh used as a model. Later, jurors said it was part of a patchwork of physical evidence that convinced them that McDonald had made up a story. Never mind that the initial army investigation mishandled critical evidence. And I'm just going to bring this up again here. If McDonald knew he was going to be blamed, would he lie to try to explain things away to make him appear more innocent if he thought he was going to be blamed for it no matter what? I mean, that's a curious question. I mean, anybody not addressing that question is obviously not doing logical, objective, neutral investigation. And then, of course, there's the theory that maybe he is partially guilty. There were other people there as well. Or, as I also outlined, if he felt guilty, because if he was involved in some kind of drug trade or something illicit and illegal, if these other people on drugs were also present and he either couldn't stop them or whatever, something happened, so he would blame himself for it anyway, and then for whatever reason narcissist and all he would he doesn't want to admit any kind of illegal wrongdoing on his side even if it has nothing to do with the his killing his own family he doesn't want to be looked at in that light so he would never admit anything and in his own mind deranged or otherwise 
like, what's he thinking? His family is dead anyway. Why is he going to ruin his own reputation at that point? Who knows? Or maybe it is true that he really did hunt one or two people down. I mean, I don't know. The motto here, of course, is the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Never mind that the initial army investigation mishandled critical evidence. Never mind that a neighbor saw three people, one with a candle, walking toward the McDonald home the night of the murders. And we're actually not going to just go into that account. We're also going to go into an account of a minimum of an ear witness, possibly also another eyewitness who saw people running from the home as well. So apparently there is a neighbor who saw three people, one with a candle, walking toward the McDonald home. Now that could theoretically be circumstantial, but what about combining that with someone who heard people running from the McDonald home through the puddles and, and everything? Never mind that the defense worked to implicate a drug addict who owned a floppy hat and blonde wig and bore an uncanny resemblance to one of McDonald's alleged attackers in a police sketch. Clothing, blood fibers, and wounds all told a different story. All the pieces came together, one juror told a Charlotte Observer reporter also covering the trial. You couldn't deny it. As long as those pieces stay firmly in place, it's difficult to imagine McDonald's fate changing now. Now, some comments here. One by Greg is interesting here. My observation is that trials are less about the truth and justice and much more about manipulating the facts. The prosecution wants to bend the truth by limiting witnesses' testimony with yes or no answers and not allowing them to expand. The defense, of course, wants to control testimony and phrase questions to win the case. If only the real world was like on Matlock and Perry Mason, where the guilty party is usually convicted and the innocent goes free. We are fortunate today to have DNA analysis, which can make a great difference in achieving justice as long as the evidence gathering and testing are done correctly. I mean, that's a huge as long as. <laughs> now, the, the other curiosity here is that it's not just about the manipulation. It's, it's also the manipulation of the jury. Because how many jurors are actually well-versed in logic and reason? I mean, seriously. That doesn't mean that, that most cases are, are tried poorly or that the guilty party goes free or that an innocent party is imprisoned, although that there's, it, there's ex endless examples of both, of course. Even if you argue that most of the time the system works, like greater than 50%, even if you go 70%, I mean, that's still a lot of innocent people in prison and a lot of guilty people out on the street. So th th I've actually mentioned this in, in years ago when I first started the podcast. There should be a logic and reason test required to be a juror. I mean, you are literally controlling the fate of many people. So that's no small task. Just randomly pulling people, just anybody who is, has a driver's license, that seems like idiocy. I mean, they take the extra step of removing people from the jury pool who are prejudiced in any way, but they don't seem to give a crap whether there's even a basic level of logic and reason. I mean, that's curious, isn't it? So I just wanted to set the stage there with that article. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Let's go further down the rabbit hole here. Who is the real Jeffrey McDonald? Exclusive interviews with his friends and family. This is on People.com. Some people find it interesting. Some people don't. This was published January 23rd, 2017. Jeffrey McDonald's loved ones portray him as kind and generous as he challenges his conviction for murdering his family. For the past 47 years, Jeffrey McDonald, the former Green Beret surgeon, convicted of the 1970 murder of his pregnant wife and two daughters, has been the subject of thousands of news articles as well as multiple books and movies. Some have portrayed him as a sociopath. Some have portrayed him as an innocent man allegedly railroaded by inexperienced army investigators. Most Mostly, it's the negative portrayals that have stuck. However, McDonald's defenders are quick to point to an extensive battery of psychological tests by different prominent forensic psychiatrists, all of which have shown no signs of a sociopathic or psychopathic personality disorder. My opinion, quote, my opinion has always been that Dr. McDonald did not have psychopathology that would have been consistent with the violent behavior that occurred on the night his family was killed, end quote, wrote Dr. Robert Sadoff, a now retired 
University of Pennsylvania forensic psychiatrist who first examined McDonald in 1970 in a 2013 affidavit for his legal defense. Now, for the first time, those have known and loved McDonald for decades have opened up to people exclusively about him. They've stood by him ever since February 17, 1970, when his wife, Colette, 26, and daughter, Kimberly, 5, and Kristen, 2, were brutally murdered at their Fort Bragg, North Carolina apartment. On January 26, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals will hear oral arguments on McDonald's actual innocence claim to overturn his conviction. Just as McDonald and his supporters have maintained his innocence, prosecutors are just as adamant he's guilty and that his conviction should stand. U.S. Attorney John Stewart Bruce declined to comment on the specifics of the case, saying in a statement to People, quote, when cases are pending court proceedings, it is the practice of our office to litigate the case in court through evidence and argument and hearings in written filings with the court rather than through the news media, end quote. Bob Stevenson, 77, Colette's brother, believes he's guilty as well. McDonald seemed to live a charmed life, a star athlete who was voted most popular and most likely to succeed at Patrickie High School on Long Island, New York. He first met Colette, his future wife, in the seventh grade. Their relationship was off and on again throughout high school. But by the time he headed to Princeton University in New Jersey and she went to Skidmore College in upstate New York, they were serious about each other. When Colette got pregnant after their sophomore year, quote, we were deeply in love, only seeing each other, and they decided to get married, end quote, McDonald says. They wed on September 14th, 63, in New York City. After McDonald's junior year at Princeton, McDonald finished his undergraduate degree in medical school simultaneously at Northwestern University in Chicago and then did his surgical internship at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City before joining the Army. People were being drafted for Vietnam, McDonald says, of his decision to enlist. I talked to Colette and decided I would volunteer as a paratrooper, something I really wanted to do. The decision meant being apart from Colette and their two young children while he underwent training. But by the time the family landed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina in August 69, they were all together again. McDonald was a newly minted Green Beret and group surgeon at the base while Colette cared for their daughters and started night classes. For the first time in their six-year marriage, McDonald had a steady paycheck, a normal schedule, and was home nights and weekends, though he moonlighted a couple of nights a month at local hospitals. Colette and I would look at each other and laugh, McDonald says. We, we'd never been so good financially. We were increasingly happy. Loved ones remember kind, generous, thoughtful man. In Fort Bragg, McDonald met and became close friends with Rick Thosen, a medical supply officer at the base, and his wife, Judy, a nurse. They were very loving, says Judy, 69. The couple frequently visited McDonald's apartment, including for Thanksgiving, two months before the murder. He loved the girls. They had everything going for them at that point. Samantha and William Alvey, McDonald's niece and nephew, were toddlers at the time of the murders. Initially, the Army cleared McDonald in the murders, after which he moved to Long Beach, California. Along with their mother, Judy, Samantha, and William would spend two weeks every summer with McDonald. Quote, I just remember a really kind, generous, thoughtful man, says Samantha, 48, who has kept in touch with McDonald in prison throughout his incarceration. He always asks how I am, how my family is, about our jobs. It's never about, oh, poor me, I'm in prison, this has been so terrible. It's always about him wanting to make sure everyone else is okay, end quote. William, set 47, says his uncle had a huge impact on his life when he was a kid, whose parents were going through a divorce. He recounted to people a birthday he had in grade school when he was 30 pounds overweight. McDonald took me to a sneaker store and bought me a nice pair of Adidas sneakers. We would go running every morning, he says. William adds, Jeff was kind of like a father role model to me and my sister because he was implementing things that were going to make us excel in life and make us progress. End quote. McDonald's influence set William on a lifelong path of health and nutrition, he says. He played football in high school and college, then went on to buy multiple health clubs after he graduated. Phyllis Gilbert got to know McDonald after her then-boyfriend brought him to California to help start an emergency room program at St. Mary Medical Center in Long Beach. Quote, he showed a maturity that I was incredibly impressed with, says Gilbert. He was a young man who was unbelievably brilliant in what he did. He was a hard worker. He was generous. He was friendly. He was open and giving and caring, all the while dealing with some of the heaviest things in life that you can imagine, end quote. Gilbert says McDonald's always volunteered to work on the toughest days for him. His daughter's birthdays, Colette's birthday, their anniversary, 
the anniversary of the murders, and family holidays. All of those Jeff wanted to be working, she says. He knew when February, the anniversary of the murders, was rolling around, you felt it. Donna Koch got to know McDonald after he was convicted. She was helping research the case for an appeal and was closely working with former L.A. coroner Tom Noguchi, who reviewed the autopsy results and concluded that there were multiple assailants and at least one of them was left-handed. McDonald was right-handed. She went to visit McDonald in prison to this. And here, here's the other thing. I have to chime in here. If McDonald is that smart that his staging and the way that he killed them, he, if he specifically did that so it would look like multiple perpetrators using his left hand, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, why would he be so dumb as to use materials already in the home and the whole ice pick situation with the shirt? Does that make any sense? Because that's what I was going over in episode one. Either he's that smart that he, would, he wouldn't make dumb mistakes like that. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Or maybe he has a split personality. One of his personalities wanted him to get caught, and he was shifting between personalities during the murders. Or if he's that dumb, then how could he stage it so well as to look like multiple assailants? I mean, something's not jiving here. She went to visit McDonald in prison to discuss the results based on Dr. Noguchi's investigation. Quote, I remember I was so excited because Dr. Noguchi's results were consistent with what Jeff had been saying, she says. I was rattling off this and that, and I looked at him, and he was the color of white chalk. And he said, to you, this is evidence. To me, you're talking about my little girl. He was trying not to cry. It was one of the most poignant things that, I had, that had happened, and I will never forget the look on his face and how stupid I felt, end quote. And you know what's curious, because everybody always focuses on how much of a narcissist he appears to be and, and his appearance on the talk show, et cetera, et cetera. He could have also been on drugs on that appearance, whatever. And then they say there's zero evidence, there's any remorse or any emotion and all that. Well, apparently there is, unless all these people are lying. Again, that doesn't really point to innocence or guilt, because, you know, obviously in emotional situations or in drug-induced... Uh, rages anything can happen that doesn't mean someone wouldn't show emotions after the fact and if someone is a narcissist or a sociopath who's innocent of a crime you can't expect them to show emotions can you like the coincidence there is to really a clueless bunch in this case john gardner spent several years behind bars with mcdonald at the federal prison in sheridan oregon he came up to me and befriended me, saying, Is there anything I can do for you, says Gardner44, who had been out of prison for 13 years but stays in touch with McDonald. Quote, Everyone called him Doc. He was like a role model. He helped people a lot, black, white. He helped everybody in there. People respected him, end quote. Gardner knew the crime McDonald was convicted of but couldn't bring himself to talk about it. Quote, I've seen him cry about it, he says. I've seen tears chokes me up just to think about it, end quote. Unless people think, I mean, McDonald just paid off all these people to lie and say that, but then why wouldn't he pay off more? Because it's not like there's that many people talking about him crying and being emotional. There, there's really not. There's not that many. So, yeah. Again, it's, it's just things just do not jive in this case. I don't know how anybody could think this is just so definitively clear-cut. Because even if he didn't kill them, if, it's still possible he could have been involved in some kind of criminal activity with drugs, etc., that brought those people to the house in the first place. Because are we to believe that it was just absolutely random? I mean, that's tough. That's tough. So both on the side, innocent or guilty, there, there seems to be more to the story. Let's look at this article from September 15th, 2012 on Daily Mail. New DNA evidence could clear ex-Green Beret doctor of killing his pregnant wife and two daughters in 1970. Jeffrey McDonald, a clean-cut Green Beret and doctor convicted of killing of his pregnant wife and their two daughters, is getting another chance to prove his innocence more than four decades after the slangs terrified a nation gripped by his tales of Charles Manson-like hippies doped up on acid, slaughtering his family in their own home. And you know what's kind of crazy? People that say he, he made that up? There's clear evidence that there were Charles Manson-like hip, doped-up hippies on acid in the area. Now, whether or not they killed his family, that's a separate matter. But it's not like he made up the presence of Manson-like hippies doped up on acid. Because as we went over in the, first in the first episode, Stokely and her crew 
and people associated with her, they were, or at least her, she was obsessed with Manson. There was all this graffiti. There were, you know, they were on acid, self-admitted. I mean, so it's not like he pulled that out of the ether and just made that up because a lot of goofs were pretending that he just made that up because of some magazine. There's literally Manson-like doped up hippies on acid in the area. Again, doesn't mean they did this crime, but the case now hinges on something that wasn't available when he was first put on trial, DNA evidence. A federal judge will convene a hearing on Monday to consider new DNA evidence and witness testimony that McDonald and his supporters say will finally clear him of a crime that became the basis of a best-selling novel and TV drama. It's just the latest twist in a case that has been the subject of military and civilian courts' intense legal wrangling and shifting alliances. This is Jeff's opportunity to be back in court almost 33 years to the day of his conviction, says Catherine McDonald, who married him a decade ago while he's been in prison. McDonald, now 68, was not eligible for parole until 2020 and had never wavered from his claim that he didn't kill his pregnant wife, Colette, and their two daughters, five-year-old Kimberly and two-year-old Kristen. He has maintained that he awoke from a slumber on their sofa in their home on the base of Fort Bragg in the early morning hours of February 17, 1970, and they were being attacked by intruders, three men and a woman. In October 2000 letter, McDonald wrote to Catherine McDonald, he wrote, quote, it would be a dishonor to their memory to compromise the truth and admit to something I didn't do, no matter how long it takes, end quote. So again, this is kind of similar to uh, to the Stephen Avery situation. In Stephen Avery's original frame up by the same people when there wasn't 36 mil on the line, he refused to say he was guilty to get out of prison because he just refused to cop to something he did not do. So is Mc so I mean that's kind of curious that McDonald is taking the same path. I mean it's kind of weird. I mean it, it, yeah, I get, that doesn't mean he's innocent, but it's kind of weird. The gruesome stabbing and beating deaths came just 3 months after the Manson family slangs in California. IA. The pregnant wife and McDonald's description of the woman attacker chanting acid is groovy kill the pigs all fed into fears that Manson type killers were on the loose in North Carolina. The word pig was written in blood on a headboard, the same word that was written on the door of Manson victim Sharon Tate's house in Los Angeles. You know what else is kind of weird though? Like, would it really be that smart? Because it, it just seems so outlandish. To, if McDonald did it and he was trying to make it look like he didn't, it just, it's really weird. I mean, unless he was in some kind of drug-induced rage, again, it just seems strange that he would choose all of that. I mean, it's just a little weird. The Army charged the Ivy League-educated McDonald with murder, then dropped the charges months later after an Article 32 hearing. By December 1970, McDonald was not just a free man, but had also received an honorable discharge. But his father-in-law, Alfred Kassab, who initially believed in his innocence, changed his mind and eventually persuaded prosecutors to pursue the case in civilian court. In 79, McDonald was charged, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison, a sentence he now serves at the federal prison in Cumberland, Maryland. McDonald had stood by his innocence claim so strongly that he refused to apply for parole for years. And when he did, he refused to acknowledge any guilt and was rejected. McDonald and his supporters have continued to pursue legal avenues over the years to try to clear his name. U.S. District Court James Fox will consider two types of evidence. Three hairs that don't match the family's DNA and a statement from Jimmy Britt, a deputy U.S. Marshal, when the case was tried. Britt, who has since died, gave a statement to the defense attorneys in 2005 that he heard prosecutor Jim Blackburn threaten Helena Stokely, a troubled woman whom McDonald had identified as one of the attackers. A previous McDonald attorney has said Stokely was prepared to testify. She was in the McDonald home the night of the murders until Blackburn threatened to charge her with the slayings. She later testified she couldn't remember where she was that night. The f and again, this is clear, even if he's guilty, this is just such a clear wrongful conviction just because of antics like these. The fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals granted McDonald's request for the hearing. It's expected to last up to two weeks and Fox will determine whether to order a new trial. This is the first time the judge is having to consider all the evidence in the case as a whole, said Chris Mumma, head of the NC Center on Actual Innocence, which has a pending request for DNA testing on other items found in the home. Pieces of evidence were considered in the past. Now the Fourth Circuit has told the judge to consider the evidence as a whole, whether admitted at trial or not. The, a lab was able to get DNA testing from the roots of hair, so Mama is optimistic that other evidence can be tested if the judge agreed.
The center has asked that 40 items be tested, but hundreds of bloodstains were collected along with the weapons, the eyeglasses the children wore, and pieces of the gloves used to write the word pig. In 79, only blood typing existed, but not DNA testing. Jeffrey Collette and their daughters all had different blood types, so prosecutors could recreate which people were in which rooms together. But Mama asked... What if the blood types belong to people outside the McDonald home? And that's a very good question. Because if they only had the types, but they didn't actually match the DNA to them. I mean, this is insane that people aren't talking about this. I mean, it's absolutely insane because they just assumed it was them because they also have the blood type. But how many other billions of people in the world have the same blood type as these individuals? So, I mean, it's just absolute insanity that people think that this is not only beyond a reasonable doubt, but anywhere within the same universe. I mean, it's just, it's really weird. There's evidence that I think would be worth testing to determine if there's DNA evidence not tied to family members, or that does, she said. The DNA testing may completely confirm the government's theory. Fox will consider the statement of Britt, who accused former prosecutor Jim Blackburn of threatening Stokely. Blackburn later went into private practice and was found guilty of several ethical violations. He was disbarred and served a prison sentence. Because he's likely a witness, Blackburn can't talk about the case. He does, however, support the trial verdict. We prosecuted the case to the best of our ability, he said. We still believe the verdict was correct. Like the Manson murders, the McDonald killings led to books, most famously, Fatal Vision, which also was the basis of a television miniseries that concluded McDonald was guilty. Earlier this month, documentary filmmaker Errol Morris's book, A Wilderness of Error, was published. There will be some familiar faces at the proceedings, but others have played central roles in the case we'll be missing. Stokely died in 83 at age 32 of pneumonia and cirrhosis of the liver. Britt, the U.S. Deputy Marshal who said the prosecutor threatened Stokely, also has since died. Jeffrey McDonald's father-in-law, Kassab, has also died. Now, Colette McDonald's brother, Bob Stevenson, will be there to fill his role. The truth is, there is nothing new out there, said Stevenson73, who declined to say where he lives, saying he receives death threats. There is nothing. Do you know how much DNA is in my home and your home? The mere discovery of DNA has nothing to do with the man's guilt. I mean, that's true with a man's guilt. That's true. That is true. But it also is not beyond a reasonable doubt that McDonald committed the crime. Stevenson said he promised Kassab before he died in 94 that he would continue to pursue McDonald. Until he was dead or I am dead, we will battling as adversaries, he said, adding later, I will never lose interest, I will never lose zeal, I will never lose faith. And again, I've postulated this in episode one, that if something was told, if something was told to Kassab that made him switch, that made him turn on McDonald. If that something wasn't true, what does that mean? So as of 2017, apparently there are still three hairs that don't match anybody known in the case. Now, I'm not sure if it's been definitively stated who they were tested against, like Stokely or the other people, the, the other possible people there. So we really don't know. And also, I don't know if it's been reported what what else has or hasn't been tested because again we do know lab reports were hidden and not allowed at trial for candle wax and all these other things just absolutely insane i'm going to go over another article from people here this was pu this was written by nicole wesensi egan published january 20th 2017 who were the suspects that jeffrey mcdonald says murdered his family helena stokely and greg mitchell both now deceased repeatedly confessed to the murders of Jeffrey McDonald's family. And this is actually kind of curious because in a lot of cases, you do have a crazy that might confess to murders they didn't commit. But here we have not one, but two of the alleged confessing independently to different people. I mean, that is a curiosity. Is there any other true crime case like this? When military police officer Ken Micah arrived at Jeffrey McDonald's Fort Bragg, North Carolina apartment February 17, 1970, he saw McDonald in the master bedroom lying on his stomach next to his bloodied wife, Colette. I see he's still alive, and I lean down next to him and say, who did this? Micah tells people. And he starts describing three guys and a woman. 
See, that's another thing, too. Like, how often is somebody who killed their family would lie so specifically about that? <laughs> the woman he described, long blonde hair or wig, a floppy hat, and knee-high boots. I mean, this is literally something out of what? Like a cartoon? I mean, to think that a highly intelligent individual would, would relay such a bizarre, outlandish story? I mean, that is kind of weird. That's kind of weird, especially if he knows that nobody can corroborate it. Like, put yourself in McDonald's shoes. Like, let's say he's not in a drug, drug-induced drug rage, or even if he is. If he knows nobody could have seen these people, unless, of course, you want to argue that he saw them hanging around outside, maybe. And that's why he named them, because then he knew neighbors could corroborate their presence. I mean, that's really the only thing I can think of where if he's guilty, but then again, why would he, why would he make all these other just incredibly dumb mistakes if he's smart enough to do that? Again, it doesn't really make sense. The woman he described, blonde hair or wig, floppy hat, knee-high boots, resembled a woman Micah had passed on the way to the apartment belonging to McDonald, the Green Beret surgeon. Micah said it was unusual to see a woman alone at that hour at Fort Bragg. He told his lieutenant to send a police car, but no car was ever sent. Well, that's interesting. So they don't care about... What? what? That's kind of weird. Later that morning, Fayetteville police detective Prince Beasley heard a description of the intruders and recognized one of them. The female as Helena Stokely, who had a history with drugs and was one of his narcotics informants. Beasley had his dispatch call CID, the Army's investigative division, to let them know he had one of the suspects. So let me get this straight. Not one, but two officers actually recognized one of the alleged suspects. So Mike, military police officer Ken Micah, he actually saw the woman on the way there. Because a lot of goof guilters say, oh, nobody ever saw her. That was all in the imagination and made-up nonsense of McDonald. Now, that's a silly argument because we have not one, not two. Apparently, there was also like one or two other drivers who apparently saw her that night as well, or someone who looked like her, and then another driver who also saw a woman alone, but supposedly not her. But either way... I mean, there's a lot of corroboration to his story here, true or untrue. It's just, it's a little weird. I mean, to say beyond a reasonable doubt that he's guilty when, when there are, there is corroboration and there's actually even more mind shocking corroboration that we're going to get to. Now, again, that doesn't mean he's completely innocent, but it does mean that there could have been other people in the home. So Beasley had his dispatch call CID to let them know he had one of the suspects, but no one ever responded, he said. I mean, what kind of investigation is this? Thus began Stokely's long and complicated relationship with the case of the murder of Jeffrey McDonald's wife, Colette, 26, and their daughters, Kimberly, 5, and Kristen, 2. Over the next 12 years, she repeatedly confessed to being at the McDonald home on February 17, 1970, the night of the murders. So did her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell a Vietnam veteran who picked up a heroin addiction while fighting overseas. But more than nine years after the murders, in 79, McDonald was convicted of the murders. He has always maintained his innocence, though prosecutors and Colette's brother, Bob Stevenson, are just as adamant he's guilty. You know, if, if none of these people existed... And, and actual officers didn't know about them, and there were no actual confessions... I mean, this would definitely, I mean, and that's kind of scary, too, if he's innocent, that it would point to his guilt if they didn't exist and weren't identified. Even if, let's say he's innocent, that's scary because, I mean, it still wouldn't be beyond a reasonable doubt, but you would maybe understand why he was convicted a little bit more. On January 26th, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia will hear oral arguments on McDonald's actual innocence claim, which has a high legal hurdle for overturning a conviction. U.S. Attorney John Stewart Bruce declined to comment with the specifics of the case, saying in a statement to people, when cases are pending, court proceedings, it is the practice of our court, of our office, to litigate the case in court through evidence and argument and hearings and written filings with the court rather than through the news media. The cult. Stokely and Mitchell ran with a group of people they called their cult. Two of the members matched the descriptions of the other two alleged intruders given by McDonald. A black man wearing a green army fatigue jacket with sergeant stripes, that's oddly specific, and a white man with pock marks on his chin and cheeks. 
another relatively specific description. So that's actually curious. So we have matches for all four individuals. Or were there two white guys, or is, is Stokely's boyfriend not the match? So we have matches for at least three, very specific matches for at least three of the four individuals. So this supposedly made-up cult that McDonald just threw out of nowhere, there just so happens to be one in the area where at least three of the four intruders, alleged intruders, alleged cult members, just happened to match exactly... Is that a bridge too far for most people? Now, again, if McDonald is this genius and he saw them hanging around and he intentionally named them and described them accurately, but again, if he did that, why did he, if he's that smart, how could he botch this up so poorly? I mean, it's kind of weird. You would think he would at least make it look like more of a struggle. I mean, he's a green beret and there's literally no, almost there's one knocked off, not slightly knocked over table. I mean, yeah, it's it's rough. Because, again, if you look in movies and everything, you would think, like, it's not that... Even somebody who's stupid could do a better job of staging some kind of fight. Just a few hours before the murders at 10.30 p.m., Beasley saw Stokely wearing the blonde wig, floppy hat, and knee-high boots with the black man he said later in a declaration for the case. Though Stokely was a troubled drug addict at the time of the murders, she wasn't always that way, says her younger brother, Gene Stokely. Their father was a retired army colonel, and the family was idyllic until Helena began using drugs. And again, check out episode one where we go over into all these crazy situations in and around the base where Stokely apparently gets off scot-free with everything. She was always upbeat, says Jean57. She had so much talent singing and playing piano, she got singing lessons from a member of the Fayetteville Symphony. A little pizza parlor in the Haymount section of Fayetteville became an area for dealers and users during Helena's last year in high school, Jean says. According to my mom, a detective with the Fayetteville police approached her and asked her to funnel them info, he says. It sounded like she agreed, decided to play the part, and became more and more involved. She was doing a good thing. She let herself be taken in so deep it had a hold on her. It was her downfall like quicksand. It won't let you go. While Jean never saw his sister wearing the blonde wig, he says she used to wear different hats and hippie clothes. She also had a certain fascination with an occult, with the occult, and a black cat named Satan, Jean says. And it's kind of interesting if that all predated the Manson uh, killings. Numerous confessions by Stokely and Mitchell. In October 82, Stokely told Ted Gunderson a PI employed by McDonald that members of her cult targeted McDonald because, quote, he refused to treat heroin and opium addicted persons, end quote. Yet when it came to testify at McDonald's trial in 79, Stokely claimed she could not remember where she was at the time of the murders. In 2005, retired U.S. Marshal Jimmy Britt came forward to say he heard then-prosecutor Jim Blackburn threaten to charge Helena with murder if she said she was there that night, a claim Blackburn denies. Three months before she died in October 82, Helena traveled to see her mother with her infant son, David, and confessed one last time, says Jean. She told my mother she was there that night, and Dr. McDonald was innocent, says Jean. I know my mom, in her heart, believed it. My sister knew her time was short. She had cirrhosis. The prosecution used the fact that she was affected by drug abuse over the years, but my sister had no reason to make things up or lie. In March 2007, after his mother told him about Stokely's confession to her, Jean reached out to Catherine McDonald, Jeff's second wife, who runs a website about the case. Stokely's mother's statement is also part of McDonald's newly discovered evidence that is part of his appeal. Greg Mitchell, too, repeatedly confessed up until his death in June 82. Ann Sutton Kennedy, who ran a rehab facility for drug addicts in Fayetteville in 71, said Mitchell was briefly a patient there. Sutton claimed she saw Mitchell running out of a farmhouse owned by the rehab facility on which the words, quote, I killed McDonald's wife and children, end quote, were written on a wall in red paint. Long after McDonald's 79 conviction, Three of Mitchell's friends contacted Catherine McDonald saying he had confessed to them as well. The three people gave affidavits that are now part of McDonald's appeal. So these aren't just made up people. They have, there's actual affidavits from them. 
That's a lot of people. So we have – so both Stokely and her then-boyfriend at the time – gave all these confessions to separate people. I mean, that's kind of crazy. That's kind of crazy. And they just happened to run with two other people who looked exactly like the descriptions McDonald gave. This is all very, very curious, to say the least. In September 2012, after reading about an evidentiary hearing in McDonald's case... In the Charlotte Observer, local couple John and Chris Griffin came forward with a similar tale of an alcohol-fueled, tear-filled confession from Mitchell, who was doing some electrical work in their Lake Wiley, North Carolina home in 1980 or 81. He said, you read about Jeffrey McDonald. I'm the one. It was me. I killed them. Oh, those children, says John, who says Mitchell was full of remorse. He said he'd done something so horrible God wouldn't forgive him. Adds Chris, it scared us half to death. He just had wild eyes. According to Chris, Mitchell picked up the phone at one point and tried to call Helena, but he couldn't reach her. The Griffins came forward with their info too late for it to be part of his appeal, though they say they tried to reach attorneys connected to the case through the years after Mitchell died in June 82. We are both 99% sure Greg did it, says John. We had no doubt he was entirely capable of it, and when he fessed up in such a crying jag, there was no reason for us to doubt him. Yeah, I mean, this this is, is truly, truly mind-shocking information. All right, so let's go through a very, very detailed analysis here on crimetraveler.org, posted November 14th, 2020. Reckless speculation about Jeffrey McDonald. Jeffrey McDonald was convicted of murdering his family in 79. Serving homicide investigator and author Barney Doyle asks you to join him as he reviews the evidence to examine the truth in this case. If you've already read my book, the book he's referring to is Reckless, Reckless Speculation About Murder by Barney Doyle then you know how this works. If not, let me give you the short version. We are going to solve some murders. Okay, we won't actually solve them, but to the best of our abilities, with the info available, we are going to make a guess. If you use a loose enough definition of the word solve, then I think that qualifies. Early in the morning of February 17th, 1970, McDonald called police and reported that a group of four or five hippies had entered his home. I mean, that's an interesting detail. So there could have been a fifth. So it could have been two white guys, the black guy, Stokely, and Stokely's boyfriend. So four or five hippies entered his home, knocked him unconscious, and brutally murdered his wife and two young daughters. Two competing theories emerged almost immediately. Those who knew McDonald... And another point about the four or five, if he wasn't sure... Is that because there really was some kind of fight or scuffle as he was waking up and he wasn't even sure how many people were there? Does that lend more credibility? Those who knew McDonald insisted that the hippie story was true. The police investigating the crime insisted that McDonald had murdered his family and concocted the hippie story as cover. Somebody is wrong and we're going to figure out who. There is more info available on this case than you and I could ever actually analyze. Most of it is garbage. That's the way it works in famous cases. The facts get diluted, distorted, and misconstrued into a thousand competing theories until the sheer density of the nonsense is so overwhelming that the case becomes impenetrable. We aren't going to let that happen to us. We're going to get our info primarily from two sources, Fatal Vision by Joe McGinnis and A Wilderness of Error by Errol Morris. Both books are well-researched, honest and citing sources, and reasonable in their presentation of the facts. And, of course, the books come to completely opposite conclusions, which is where we come in. For what it's worth, if you haven't read them, I recommend both books. Morris's book is a little bit more lively and readable, but McGinnis is more disciplined and journalistic in his approach. For me to accuse Morris of excessive editorialization would be the epitome of a pot calling the kettle black, so please don't infer that one of these books is better than the other. They are different in tone and substance, but I think each of them is fair on thorough and interesting. You're lucky to get two of those things in a true crime book, let alone all of them. Even though Morris and McGinnis do a fantastic job of describing the facts of the case, we are still going to use the autopsy and police reports from the JeffreyMcDonaldCase.com to help guide us as well. 
Let's start with the summary of the pertinent facts. February 17, 1970, at about 3.45 a.m., military police from Fort Bragg were dispatched to 544 Castle Drive for what the initial responding officers described as a possible domestic disturbance. Fort Bragg is a large U.S. Army base adjacent to Fayetteville, North Carolina. 544 Castle Drive was a three-bedroom apartment, about 1,000 square feet, where Captain Jeffrey McDonald lived with his pregnant wife, Colette McDonald, and their two young daughters. Between six and eight officers arrived at roughly the same time. Several officers knocked at the front door with no response, but Sergeant Richard Tavere found the back door open. He entered, passed through a small utility room, and found two people on the floor of the master bedroom. Colette McDonald was lying on her back, dead and covered in blood. Jeffrey McDonald appeared to be unconscious and was lying beside her with his head on her chest. The word pig was written in blood on the headboard. Police checked the rest of the home and found six-year-old Kimberly dead in one bedroom and two-year-old Kristen dead in another. Both were in their respective beds with the lights off in both rooms. Jeffrey McDonald regained consciousness, said that he couldn't breathe, and asked the police to check on his children. The officers attempted mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, which caused Jeffrey to choke and shake. He regained composure enough to let the responding officer to tell the responding officers that two white men, a black man and a white woman, had stabbed him. So did he not even remember what he said on the phone about four or five intruders? Because now he's saying four. Supposedly the 911 call says five. The woman was wearing a floppy hat and carrying a candle. All of the attackers were saying acid is groovy and kill the pigs. That's kind of creepy. All of them were saying that like in a chant. Jeffrey was taken to the emergency room for treatment, and the Army's Criminal Investigation Division was summoned to investigate the murders. The Army CID takes a beating in every telling of the story for the job they did on the crime scene. I'm not going to suggest they did a good job, because they certainly did not. But I think the extent of their mistakes has been exaggerated. It's not that they did every single thing incorrectly, as some critics seem to suggest. It's just that the mistakes they did make were devastating to the case. Most importantly, they let too many people into the crime scene, didn't supervise those people properly allowed potential evidence to move, or in some cases disappear, before it could be documented and did not preserve the integrity of potential trace evidence. Mistakes happen in every criminal investigation, but some mistakes are easier to overcome than others. These were not easy mistakes to overcome, especially in a case like this one turned out to be. After hearing Jeffrey McDonald's story, Officer Kenneth Maiku told the lieutenant on scene that while Maiku was responding to the call, he had seen a woman standing on the street corner a couple blocks from the McDonald home. She was wearing a large floppy hat. Given the time of morning and the weather conditions, light rain, Maiku thought the situation was peculiar. He recommended that the woman be located immediately, but it does not appear that any attempt was made to do so. Add that one to the list of mistakes above. This next part is going to be unpleasant, so let's get through it as quickly as possible. If you don't have the stomach for it, I understand. I'm going to describe the medical examiner's findings in the following three paragraphs, but here is a short version if you want to skip over the specifics. Colette was brutally beaten with a blunt object and stabbed multiple times with at least two sharp objects. Kimberly was beaten with a blunt object and stabbed multiple times, and Kristen was stabbed multiple times. The autopsy reports are online, but I'll warn you that the ones I reviewed include the medical examiner's photos. Do not look at those photos. There is nothing that you or I could learn from those photos that we wouldn't understand better from the written report. Those photos would serve no purpose but to hunt you, and I don't want you to go through with that. And uh, I actually share that opinion. I do not ever look at any medical examiner photos or any crime scene photos with dead bodies, and obviously none of that will be included on Mind Shock. I know some people do look at those. We simply do not do that here. I just, uh, there, there's no reason for that level of haunting. Again, the text should give you pretty much all you need. And also the diagrams. We can look at the diagram, the illustrated diagrams of, of where injuries occur. That gives you all the information you need. Colette McDonald suffered approximately 37 stab wounds. There were 21 small round stab wounds scattered throughout her chest and upper left arm and another 16 elliptical gaping, gaping incisional wounds to her chest, neck, and abdomen. Her lungs, trachea, and pulmonary artery were all lacerated, causing massive internal bleeding. The two different types of stab wounds suggest two different weapons were used. The stab wounds alone would have been fatal, but Colette also suffered three large lacerations and several smaller lacerations to the front sides and back of her head. The lacerations were caused by a blunt object and were accompanied by a skull fracture. 
Lastly, Colette suffered a compound fracture of her right wrist with the bone exposed, another compound fracture just below her left elbow, and a fracture of her left wrist. She had been approximately four months pregnant with what the medical examiner discovered was a boy. And here's another thing, too. I mean, I don't know if they can do that, you know, for cases that far in the past. I'm not even 100% sure they can do that today. Can they determine whether these wounds were inflicted at approximately the same time, because then if they could, then you know for sure it wasn't one perpetrator. Six-year-old Kimberly was struck in the head an undetermined number of times with a blunt object. The medical examiner noted at least two blows to the right side of her head, causing multiple skull fractures, including one that penetrated through the thickness of the skull and dislocated a portion of it. Kimberly's nose was broken and displaced to the side as well. Kimberly was also stabbed approximately eight to ten times in the neck with incisional-type stab wounds similar to those identified in her mother. So does this really seem like there's at least two people inflicting damage at once? Based on the bleeding of the wounds, the medical examiner believed that Kimberly was beaten before she was stabbed, though either attack would have been fatal on its own. Now, is there a way to know whether they, it happened simultaneously, though? They said the bleeding of the wounds? Two year or I mean, yeah, that's tough. Two-year-old Kristen suffered more than 20 stab wounds to the chest and neck and another dozen to her back. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's tough reading this, but even even like obviously we, we we're gonna try to get the emotions out of it, but logistically, I mean, logistically, could this be done by one individual? The wounds also appear to have been caused by two different weapons. Kristen also had cuts to the front and back of both hands, along with bruising on her neck, shoulders, and buttocks. Several of the stab wounds penetrated her heart, causing her death. Holy expletive, that was worse than I thought it was going to be. I need a break. Let's take 10 minutes and come back later. Okay, I'm back. I don't know how you feel about capital punishment, but if we figure out who did it, then I propose they deserve nothing short of a lifetime of agony and misery. Jeffrey McDonald was hospitalized for nine days, but fared better than the rest of his family. The examining physician noted a one centimeter break in the skin on his chest, which in actuality was a stab wound that caused a partially collapsed lung. The doctor also noted his swelling and a laceration in the middle of Jeffrey's forehead, a superficial laceration to his abdomen, and a 1.5 centimeter laceration to the front of his upper arm. I can tell that two things are really standing out to you already. Number one, how come Jeffrey McDonald had such comparatively minor injuries considering what happened to the rest of his family? And number two, who is this mysterious woman in the floppy hat? I like the way you think you're good at this. Okay, hold on. I have some thoughts here. So we talked about one possible reason is that maybe they weren't trying to kill McDonald. Because if they were trying to punish him by killing his family, the injuries could have been minor on purpose. Also, here's another point. If McDonald really is guilty, why wouldn't he beat himself up more? I mean, even Jim Carrey did a a half-decent job of beating the crap out of himself in Liar Liar. Like, he really couldn't have just added a whole bunch of cut, like, non-life-threatening cuts. I mean, he's a doctor. Just just some light cuts, arms, legs, just a whole bunch. So at least it would match, you know, at least kind of, sort of match. I mean, not really, because they wouldn't be deep enough. But still, some kind of appearance that he would be, be more busted up. You know, throw himself, you know, throw his face through a window. Like, just just damage yourself some more, you know? But then again, also, he didn't even bother to do more than tip over a table to stage a, a fight scene if he's guilty. Like, this just doesn't add up here. It just really doesn't. The CID processed the scene, but not terribly well. So we aren't going to get nearly as much reliable evidence out of their analysis as we would expect from an indoor murder scene where police responded that quickly. Investigators observed that a coffee table in the room was tipped over on its edge. They noted that the rest of the living room was undisturbed. And again, even a dumb person. Like, why wouldn't he just throw himself into the wall, into a bookcase, through a table, into the window? Like, it would be so... It it wouldn't really be that hard to make it look like he had been in in a real fight and the room matching that. But for whatever reason, he didn't do that. If he's guilty. If he's innocent, then of course he didn't do that. They later learned that at least one potted plant had been tipped over when responding officers arrived, but an unknown person had tipped it back upright. 
That's definitely not ideal at a crime scene, and it does raise a lot of questions about their other observations. The investigators put a lot of emphasis on the undisturbed living room, and it was later the foundation on which they built their theory that Jeffrey McDonald murdered his own family and staged the scene. See, to me, that would make it seem less likely that, that it's a staged scene. Because why not stage it properly? Just like, you know, again, why wouldn't he just give himself some more superficial wounds at least just to make it look worse? They insisted that it was virtually impossible for the coffee table to end up on its side unless it was deliberately placed like that. They tipped the coffee table over hundreds of times and insisted that every single time it came to rest on its top and not its side. A mechanical engineer drafted a really official-looking document with equations and diagrams to argue that the table would always come to rest on its top when it was tipped over. But a skeptical army judge who was presiding over a hearing on the murders wanted to see for himself. He went to the McDonald home, tipped over the table, and it landed on its side on the very first try. That's a nice lesson for us to keep in mind as we try to solve these murders. Always be humble about your evidence and conclusions because they're never as definitive or convincing as they might seem to you. Another point, though. What would all that coffee table being knocked over? That means nothing because if he's in a fight and he's knocked over and his leg is somehow next to the table causing it to be on its side. Like who said the fight played out where the table was kicked on its side without a body accompanying it? Because if, an, if a human being is being knocked down next to it, there could be a jumble of arms and legs that causes it to stay upright on its side. Obviously, that's not even necessary, as we see about this judge that did it on the first try. But I'm just saying, even if it, even if it normally wouldn't land like that, how can you replicate every single possible combination of somebody falling with it? But it sounds like they didn't even do that a single time. They just tipped it over hundreds of times without a jumble of arms and legs around it. Colette was dressed in pink pajamas, but she also had a bath mat and a blue pajama top laying across her chest. Investigators later learned that Jeffrey McDonald had been wearing the blue pajama top and it had 48 round puncture holes. If you recall, neither Colette nor Jeffrey had 48 round puncture wounds. An examiner at the FBI lab determined that all 48 of the holes could have come from the stab wounds suffered by Colette. The garment was found crumpled and folded in such a way that many of the stab wounds could have caused more than one hole in the fabric. There was also bedding on the floor near the doorway of the master bedroom, and the bedding was covered in blood. A small paring knife with a bent blade and a blood stain near the tip was found on the floor between an armchair and a dresser. The word pig was written in blood on the headboard, had a smooth texture with no fingerprints, leading investigators to believe that the culprit had worn a glove. Portions of a rubber glove were found in the master bedroom, and surgical rubber gloves were found under the kitchen sink. For what it's worth, handwriting experts also concluded that the author used their right hand. If we trust that, then we can safely eliminate any suspects who didn't have a right hand. Which is helpful because I had a theory about pirates that can now be safely discarded. Okay, that's uh, interesting humor there. But So that's interesting. So it was written, written with the right hand and one of the assailants was left-handed. So is, I mean, is, if McDonald is faking all of this to make it look like multiple perpetrators, I guess he could have written that with one hand and then used a weapon in his left hand. But then again, why couldn't he mess up the living room to make it more believable and throw himself around a little bit more? Because that, that would cover those obvious bases. But clearly that wasn't done. Outside the back door, investigators found a wooden club that appeared to have blood on it, another paring knife, and an ice pick. McDonald denied that the family had an ice pick, but several witnesses who had been to the house contradicted him. The club had blue fibers on it that were consistent with McDonald's pajamas, but also had dark wool fibers that were not definitively matched to anything in the McDonald home. Huh, interesting. With three people dead and a fourth stab, there was a great deal of blood in the house, as luck would have it. Each member of the family had a different blood type. In the master bedroom, investigators found blood matching Colette, Jeffrey, and Kimberly's blood types. In Kimberly's bedroom, investigators found blood matching Kimberly, Colette, and Kristen's blood types. In Kristen's bedroom, investigators found blood matching everybody's type. 
Blood matching Jeffrey's type was found at both the kitchen and bathroom sinks. Some of the blood was undoubtedly transferred by the killer or killers moving about the house, but the volume of blood showed that Colette was actively bleeding in both the master bedroom and Kristen's bedroom, and that Kimberly was actively bleeding in the master bedroom and her own bedroom. Kristen appeared to have been attacked and killed entirely in her own room. And again, do we have definitive testing since then? Because originally it was just on the type, they just assumed it was these individuals because these individuals had corresponding blood types. I mean, that's, that's a crazy assumption. Not that it's wrong, but how do you know that it's right? There was also a bloody footprint leading out of Kristen's room. The blood was Colette's. Again, are we sure of that, or was it Colette's blood type? But the foot appeared to be Jeffrey's. This couldn't be determined for certain, however, because the footprint was destroyed when CID attempted to cut out the floorboards to preserve it. Wow. Talk about incompetence. It was destroyed in an attempt to preserve, as opposed to other evidence, which is like accidentally destroyed or trampled over. A fingerprint that was never matched to anybody was found in a jewelry box in the McDonald bedroom, and Jeffrey later claimed that two rings were missing from the jewelry box. Jeffrey McDonald's wallet was definitely stolen, but by an EMT who eventually confessed to it. Okay, so here's the thing. So Jeffrey's claiming that rings in his wallet were stolen, and then everybody's saying, oh, he's lying, he just did that to make it look like it was also a robbery. And then this EMT comes out corroborating that he stole at least the wallet. So did Jeffrey also not lie about the rings being missing? CID failed to preserve and photograph most of the fingerprint evidence correctly, and the fingerprints they were able to identify came back to either the McDonald's or the investigators on scene. There were wax drippings on Kimberly's bedroom floor and the coffee table that did not match any of the candles found in the McDonald's home. So is that a smoking gun? Because we, we have at least one inter one witness who said that he saw a woman with a candle going to the McDonald home. And then, obviously, the lab reports proving this were not allowed at trial, which is suspicious. So, wax drippings on both... So, there's only two areas of wax dripping. Kimberly's bedroom floor and on the coffee table. And they do not match any of the candles tested within the McDonald home. That's curious. A magazine found in the living room had a feature story on the Manson murders, which had happened in California IA six months prior. A witness who had been at the house several days earlier claimed that he and McDonald had discussed the magazine story and that, like everyone else in the U.S. at the time, Jeffrey was aware of the Manson murders. And that's another thing, too. Like, some people were saying, oh, he just made that up because of that. But what are the controls here? I mean, that was one of the most discussed topics in the country. Not to mention, obviously, Stokely was also obsessed with them. Another family lived in the apartment above the McDonald's. The day of the murder, each member of the family said that they had not heard anything out of the ordinary. The family's dog had not barked until the police arrived. During a subsequent interview, however, the wife of the family claimed that she had been woken up at an unknown time by the sound of Colette speaking loudly and angrily, although the woman could not hear what was said. The woman's teenage daughter, whose bedroom was directly above the McDonald's living room, claimed she heard an adult male either sobbing loudly or laughing hysterically. So that's another thing, like, you really have to be careful about initial statements, because obviously it was reported no one heard anything. Well, that wasn't true, because they did, it's just the initial reports basically said that there was nothing out of the ordinary. Investigators didn't do a f formal interview with Jeffrey right away, but spoke to him as he recovered. He relayed the following story as presented in the McGinnis book. Jeffrey McDonald had worked a 24-hour shift at the emergency room for si from 6 a.m. on February 15th to 6 a.m. on February 16th, although he did manage to catch a little sleep in a hospital cot during slow stretches. He then worked his regular shift for the Army on February 16th. That's, cr that's a crazy schedule. That evening, he came home and took Kimberly and Kristen to go feed the horse he had gotten them as a Christmas present. Wow. So that's also curious. So the people said that he didn't like being a father and all this stuff. After a 24-hour shift and then a regular shift, 
he's still going out to go to go feed the, a horse he got his kids as a Christmas present. Wow. I mean, that's insane. How many fathers would actually do that? Again, I'm, I'm not saying that speaks to innocence or guilt, but it, to those that claim that he was an unattentive father, I mean, that, that would contradict that claim. Colette was taking evening classes at a local college. So Jeffrey tended to the kids that evening while she attended a psychology class. He put Kristen in bed at 7 p.m., then fell asleep on the floor for an hour. Kimberly woke him up at 8 p.m. to watch television. Then Jeffrey put her to bed at 9 p.m. At about 9.40 p.m., Colette returned home from class. Jeffrey and Colette had a drink and watched television. Then Colette went to bed. Jeffrey stayed up for a while longer and read a book. At a little after 2 a.m., Jeffrey prepared to go to bed. He found that Kristen was in bed with Colette, though, and that Kristen had wet the bed. He, call he carried Kristen to her own bed then slept on the couch so he would not have to wake Colette or change the sheets. Once upon a time, Neanderthal men were pretending not to see toddler poop on cave floors. In a thousand years, a future dad will be tiptoeing around his rocket ship, feigning obliviousness to the spa space baby's spit-up. <laughs> Jeffrey McDonald may indeed be a monster, but not because he let his wife sleep beside a pool of urine instead of cleaning it up. That's a decision that four out of five dads would support, and the fifth guy is probably a liar. Well, I don't know. Is it more about being too lazy to clean it up versus not wanting to wake her up? Because how could he clean that up and change the sheets without waking her? Jeffrey McDonald said that he did not know how long he was asleep on the couch, but that he was woken by the sound of his wife shouting, Jeff, Jeff, help, and Kimberly screaming, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He opened his eyes and saw four people standing over him. One was a black man wearing an army fatigue jacket. Two were white men, one of which had a mustache and a red sweatshirt. One of the men was wearing gloves. There was also a blonde woman with a floppy hat wearing boots and carrying a candle in front of her face. All of them were wet as though they had been out in the rain. The woman was chanting, acid is groovy and kill the pigs. McDonald tried to get up but was struck in the head with what he thought was a baseball bat. He started to struggle with the men and his pajama top was wrestled over his head and around his wrists. He felt a sharp pain in his chest and looked down to see that he had been stabbed with an ice pick. He then passed out face down on the floor. When Jeffrey regained consciousness, the house was silent. Well, here's another thing, too. Like, what if they thought they killed him? That's another curiosity. Because if they're on drugs, would they not know? I mean, I don't know. If they thought they killed him, would they stop attacking him? Even though, obviously, the severity of injuries were so extreme to the others. I mean, I don't know. When he regained consciousness, the house was silent. He went to each of the bedrooms, found that that his wife and daughters were dead. He tried to resuscitate them, but it didn't work. He also removed a small knife from his wife's chest and covered her with his pajama top. Jeffrey went into the bathroom to check on his stab wound, then made two attempts to call the police, one with a phone in the bedroom and one with the phone in the kitchen. Wait, why? Why? He then waited with his wife until police arrived. While investigators on scene immediately suspected Jeffrey in the murders, a Fayetteville narcotics detective noticed that the description of the woman in the floppy hat sounded an awful lot like an informant he knew by the name of Helena Stokely. The detective tracked her down on the day of the murders and found her with a group of the types of drug addicts and hippies she was known to consort with. He detained the group for questioning, but CID never responded to do the actual questioning, and they were all released without charges. So there just so happens to be a group of individuals that exactly match, or almost exactly match, the perpetrators McDonald's alleges, and nobody even bothers to interview them? Wow. Wow, this is insane. Stokely's neighbor claimed to have seen Stokely arrive home in a blue car sometime between 3 and 4.30 a.m. on the morning of the murders. The neighbor claimed that in numerous discussions over the subsequent days and months, Stokely made several statements indicating that she was present for the McDonald murders or that she was so high on drugs that she could not remember if she was present. And that's kind of a weird thing, too. Like, how many drug addicts are just independently thinking, oh, yeah, maybe I was at the McDonald house during, that mur during the murders. Maybe I was there. 
Like, how many people are even saying, oh, I can't remember. Maybe I was there. Maybe I wasn't. Like, is that <laughs> like out of all of the drug addicts, is there anyone other than Stokely who was just randomly thinking, oh, maybe I was there. Maybe I wasn't. It's kind of a weird. It's kind of weird. Stokely frequently claimed to have been so high on mescaline and LSD that she could not remember anything that had happened that night. Stokely's roommate corroborated the neighbor's account and said that Stokely returned home with her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, at around 4 a.m. So here's the thing, though. Who was the lady in the hat, wig and hat, walking away from the McDonald home? Or was she picked up later for some reason? Like, why was she not with her boyfriend or these other cult members at that sighting? And I believe there's also a second sighting of another woman who may or may not have been her also alone. So that's kind of weird. Or did she leave during the murders because she didn't want to be present? And then they, they caught up with her, they picked her up walking later? At least six different people have come forward to claim that Stokely has admitted involvement in the murders to them, but she has denied any involvement to law enforcement and in court testimony. Again, we don't know how much of the the law enforcement statements were also suppressed because if she had told law enforcement, how do we know if that was never brought forward? Private investigators have also found several witnesses who claim that Mitchell has made nonspecific statements over the years that they took as proof of his involvement in the murders. I won't bore you with the de details of the Mitchell accusations because they are second and third hound accounts of vague statements made a long time before an investigator spoke to the witnesses. I mean, some of them aren't that vague that we went over. But anyway, Stokely made statements to several people about a rocking horse with a broken spring that was in the McDonald home. Now, we, I don't know if we actually went over this in episode one. This is one of, this is another one of these biggest mind shocks. There's this one and one more. And then, of course, the, the, them fleeing from the apartment. So, yeah, hope everybody's sitting down for this. We are firmly in mind shock land. So she made statements to several different people. There's a rocking horse with a broken spring. So a picture in the local paper showed the rocking horse, but Stokely was a serious drug addict at the time, so who knows how diligent she was in following the Fayetteville Observer. And the picture didn't show that the spring was broken anyway. So here's the thing, though. I mean, a lot of people, especially back in the 70s, I mean, I don't know how popular rocking horses are now. But back then, I mean, almost every home with children had a rocking horse. So that's, that, that means nothing that she said that. That wouldn't prove that she was there. But how many rocking horses specifically have a broken spring? I mean, that's a curious detail. That is curious. Stokely was known to own a blonde wig, a floppy hat, and boots. She got rid of all of them sometime after the murders. A blonde synthetic fiber was found in a hairbrush in the McDonald home. Investigators insisted that it could not have come from a wig, but Morris made a pretty convincing case that it definitely could have. During an autopsy, medical examiners routinely collected scrapings from under the fingernails of victims. Trace evidence tends to accumulate there when a victim is clawing at and fighting an attacker. A small hair was found amongst the scrapings from under Colette's fingernails. DNA testing done decades after the murder concluded that the hair did not come from any of the McDonald's. There was debate amongst the investigators whether the hair was actually under Colette's fingernails or if it was merely contamination from sloppy evidence handling. At any rate, the source of the hair has not been identified. I mean, that's kind of weird, though, because if they're listed... So, okay, but I mean, that can happen in any case, though. I mean, how many other cases they're saying that the fingernail scrapings aren't actually fingernail scrapings? I mean, that's a good point. They might not be, but to just automatically hallucinate and assume that? I mean, that's kind of weird. FBI Special Agent Paul Stumbaugh was reviewing photographs of the case when he noticed that there was a suitcase near the closet. There was blood spatter all around the suitcase, but none on it. Stumbaugh surmised that the suitcase was placed there after the murders, and I can't find fault in that logic. Whether it was done by the killer or by the officers on scene, though, is something we will never know. 
Officer Kenneth Maiku told Morris while Morris was writing his book that Maiku was aware of Stokely in 1970 and knew what she looked like. He told Morris he was certain that the woman he saw in the floppy hat was not Stokely. Okay, so this is where the plot thickens. So Maiku is the guy that saw a woman in a floppy hat not, not Stokely. And another individual, another officer apparently saw a woman who may have been Stokely but without a positive ID. Huh. Morris was skeptical that Maiku would have been able to tell under the circumstances, but Maiku was adamant. Here's the thing, though. So Maiku's on the way there. Was he really paying attention to the facial, facial features of a random woman walking with a hat? Huh. Anyway, so continuing on with this write-up. Maiku was adamant. I believe him. He was the passenger in a two-officer car. And the woman was standing on a street corner where they came to a stop. He got a good look. And officers on the beat know the regular customers. It could be at night from a block away, and I could still spot the regular customers when I was working a beat. It's a relatively small number of people that you deal with over and over in law enforcement, and you get to know them really well. Well, okay, if he stopped directly in front of her, I mean, I don't know about a block away, but if he stopped directly in front of her and saw her face and knew that it wasn't Stokely, so could there really have been two different women in a floppy hat that night? It's kind of weird, kind of weird. Or Mike, who's lying. So the circumstances... So maybe, so again, her father is some kind of colonel. Apparently, some people allege he has a lot of pull in the area. So did Maiku actually see Stokely and he simply said it wasn't her? I don't know. The polygraph examination got thrown around liberally in this investigation and it tend, uh, as it tended to in investigations of this type during that era. Let's not get bogged down with polygraph results. For what it's worth, Stokely passed a poly in which she claimed to have been present for the murders and Jeffrey failed a poly in which he claimed he didn't kill his family. A poly can be a... So that is kind of curious, isn't it? That, that is kind of curious. A poly can be a useful tool if used with restraint by a skilled polygrapher. It can be the worst kind of garbage evidence when it isn't. I don't know anything about the poly operators in this case, and there were a lot of them, so I'm choosing to ignore all of the contradictory results and move on as if the test never happened. You can do otherwise if you so choose. I mean, it's a shame fingerprint scan. I mean, Jeff McDonald's still alive, so I would assume he would agree to a fit brain fingerprint scan because... That's obviously much more accurate than a poly. And that could potentially exonerate him. For those that don't know, that's what, like, the CIA, high-ranking military, they all use that because it simply measures brainwave response. So it doesn't matter whether you're trying to lie or not. It simply measures whether the brain recognizes information. And speaking of contradictory gibberish, we are also going to ignore all of the, in quotations, evidence provided by the parade of forensic psychologists employed in this case. I'll summarize it for you so you can quickly toss it aside. Jeffrey McDonald's personality type was such that he was incapable of committing the murders, and also Jeffrey McDonald's personality type was such that he was a narcissistic psychopath capable of murder at any time. <laughs> If you read my book, and at this point there's no reason for you not to, we are friends now, buy four copies and give them to your favorite bobsled team, then you know how I feel about experts. They are critically important to understanding a lot of things, but they will also say whatever they are paid to say. Be skeptical of anything that sounds too good to be true. Good advice there. Jeffrey tried to portray his marriage as ideal, but investigators uncovered a series of facts that painted Jeffrey in a different light. He had multiple affairs during the marriage. He worked extremely long hours and took on extra jobs. And for reasons that were highly suspicious and never made clear, Jeffrey was lying to his wife about a month-long trip he was supposedly going to take to Russia. Jeffrey was the team doctor for the Fort Bragg boxing team and told Colette that he was going with the team to Russia. In actuality, there was no trip. And Jeffrey wasn't going anywhere with the team. Actually, you know something I didn't really think of that I just thought of now? Is it possible McDonald was part of some kind of like top secret CIA MK Ultra type program? Or if he was involved in some other type of top secret programs, he was using that as a cover for something. And that's why he lied. Not necessarily to go commit affairs. Although, you know, who knows? Maybe, but...
After the murders, Jeffrey went on a media campaign in which he exaggerated the extent of his injuries and ranted about the incompetence of army investigators. He also told an out... Well, here's the thing. A narcissist might do that even if he was innocent, right? I mean, that's something all of the clueless gu guilters fail to just the basic logic here. If he really is some kind of philandering, narcissistic psycho, even if he's innocent, and there's no magic Dungeons and Dragons spell where other roving cult psychotics that are looking to murder, that they magically would avoid entering a home as if they would even know that a narcissistic psycho would live there. So there's no magic Dungeons and Dragons protection spell. Like a lot of so-called true crime aficionado goofs, they think someone who's suicidal, they must have committed suicide and they couldn't have been met with foul play. As if there's some kind of magic Dungeons and Dragons spell protecting suicidal people from being victims of serial killers or other criminals. It's just a weird thing. I mean, this is basic logic. I don't know why people don't get it. But again, if McDonald is a narcissistic psycho and innocent, he would still have done all those things. <laughs> He also told an outlandish story to his former mother-in-law and father-in-law in which he claimed to have found one of the murderers tortured and killed them. This came at a time when his father-in-law was pressing him for info about the murders in the investigation. And here's another thing. Again, let's not fall for logical fallacies here. How do we know that didn't happen? And it, so McDonald, this former Green Beret, if he was also involved in top secret operations or otherwise, whatever, how do we know that didn't happen and he would have only told the family? And of course he would have denied it and said he made it up to anybody else because obviously, you know, he doesn't want to open that can of worms. McGinnis uncovered some evidence that Jeffrey McDonald had been using amphetamines, or again, if he is a narcissistic psycho and he did make up the story, even if he's innocent, would you really put it past him to make up such a story if he is a narcissistic psycho? Or even, again, some people could say that could be sympathetic to the family. He wanted to make them... I don't know, maybe if he thought, if he was a nice guy and he thought that might bring peace, would he make up such a story? I don't know. McGinnis uncovered some evidence that Jeffrey McDonald had been using amphetamines in the weeks leading up to the murder. They were not illegal at the time and were commonly used for weight loss. McDonald acknowledged using the pills, but not in the quantities alleged by McGinnis. McGinnis makes some pretty far-fetched claims about how McDonald's amphetamine use could have caused psychosis and hallucinations, which I don't think are worth considering. Colleagues tend to notice when an emergency room doctor is hallucinating. But amphetamine use, yeah, I mean, if, if it really did impair his abilities, would that, that probably would have been noticed. But amphetamine use could definitely cause irritability and exacerbate other sources of stress. The Army held what was called an Article 32 hearing in July of 1970. It was a hearing to determine if there was sufficient evidence to charge McDonald with the murders of his family. Not only did the hearing examiner determine that there was insufficient evidence to charge McDonald, he also made the rather extraordinary proclamation that Jeffrey was innocent of the crime. There is a reason we use the term not guilty instead of innocent in trials. It is exceedingly difficult to prove innocence, which is why we don't ever require somebody to do it. In 79, Jeffrey was charged with and convicted of the murders in U.S. U.S. District Court. Obviously, the jury did not agree with the Army examiner's assessment. I think that gives us a pretty good basis to make some wild guesses. Let's review what we've learned and see who committed these murders. Also, another point, if Stokely's father, this colonel with some kind of pull, if this other Army investigator, they knew that they could never... They knew that Stokely would be protected, but they also knew that if it was her and her cohorts that did the crime, if she admitted it, and her father knew that she did it, and he told the army investigators, and there was some kind of agreement to never press charges, then they would know that McDonald was innocent. Just another uh, wrinkle there that I don't think anybody's considered. The facts that point to McDonald. Jeffrey, Jeffrey's family was brutally murdered while he sustained relatively minor injuries. Why would intruders leave a witness alive when he was unconscious and, and completely at their mercy? It's even more confounding in light of how excessive the violence was towards his wife and daughters. And again, I've actually addressed that so many times now. One, if they wanted to make him suffer and not kill him and punish him by only killing his family. Or two, they're that high that they thought they did kill him with the ice pick when he, when he lost consciousness. But who knows? Or maybe if they're doing some kind of occult ritual, they're only after women and children, so they don't really care about him, so they thought they killed him quickly anyway. Their goal was never to torture him in that capacity. 
Continuing on here, Jeffrey was a Green Beret who regularly trained with the Fort Bragg boxing team. I'm not insisting that he could have overcome three adult men in a fight, but we would certainly expect a man like Jeffrey fighting for his family's lives to sustain more than a bump on the noggin and a single non-incapacitating stab wound. But here's the thing, though. If he did faint from the stab wound, either... I mean, that could be for a bunch of different reasons. Again, if he's on, if he's this drugged out and he's semi-conscious in the first place, and he just woke up and they're already standing over him and stabbing him with an ice pick, I mean, there's not really a fight there. That would also explain why there wouldn't have been much of a struggle if that if his story is true. McDonald said that he placed his pajama top on his wife after she was dead, but it was full of holes and he wasn't. He claimed that he used it to fight off his attackers while it was tangled around his wrists. But what are the odds that a pajama top wrapped around his wrists would get stabbed 40 times in a fight without McDonald's wrist, hands, or forearms getting stabbed at all? That's an interesting point. That's definitely an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that can be explained I mean, in either direction, really. Because why would he be so dumb as to try to pass that off? That doesn't make sense either. McDonald claimed that he woke up to the sound of his wife and Kimberly both screaming for help, and he woke up to four people standing over him. So how many people was he suggesting were in there? If his wife was being attacked in one room, his daughter in another, and four people standing over him, then that was a little crowded. Yet his neighbors living above them heard none of those people, and the neighbor's dog didn't bark until police arrived. I mean, the dog not barking is a problem whether he's innocent or guilty. I mean, I don't understand why. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, that doesn't, I don't understand how that would point to his guilt. That's strange, regardless of what happened. Okay, so again, if he was on drugs and he had just woken up and they were standing over him, there were so many different weapons used on his family how do they know there, that these criminals didn't pass through stabbing and hitting, then were standing over him? Then after they stabbed him with the ice pick, he lost consciousness. They went and, and did more damage. Or, again, his memory, if he was sleeping, did he hear that in his sleep before he awoke? And then, you know, a minute or two later, he, he or at least that's how his memory, I mean, in a traumatic event, memory is not going to be perfect. Again, this doesn't mean he's innocent in any way, but I don't see how it points to his guilt. Jeffrey McDonald's blood was found in front of the kitchen sink where he kept surgical gloves. Investigators believe that whoever wrote pig and blood on the headboard was wearing gloves. The murder weapons were abandoned just outside the back door, and even though Jeffrey claimed otherwise, they all seemed to come from the McDonald household. Why would intruders not bring any weapons to a murder, and why would they risk leaving behind fingerprints? Well, again, if they're on drugs, <laughs> I mean, are they, is he seriously? So the allegation is that this cult, I mean, or is there an allegation that it wasn't the cult that McDonald said and it was other perpetrators who were lo not on drugs and would have been logical? I mean, you know, <laughs> same way as why would McDonald not stage a better scene if he was the one who did it? I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions here. I don't see how it points... I don't see how that points to his guilt. Not, I mean, it doesn't really point to his innocence either, but I don't see how that points to his guilt. Domestic violence homicides are the most common type of homicide for women and children. That is true. And if there weren't all these sightings of this woman in a floppy hat, you know, that would hold more weight. Jeffrey was a documented philanderer. Despite the many character witnesses who insisted that he would never hurt his family, he did admit to extramarital affairs. Cheating on your wife hurts your family, and to insist otherwise is disingenuous. I mean, this is a silly point that would point to his guilt. I mean, how many philanderers out there are out there? I mean, just countless. I mean, the vast majority of them would probably not be capable of murdering their families just because they're philanderers. For other reasons, yes, but not the philandering. Just like there's people who killed their families who are not philanders. Again, phil you know, like that, that's kind of like a, this is why controls are needed whenever you're doing any kind of scientific, legitimate analysis. Jeffrey went on television to provide interviews to the media in which he exaggerated the extent of his injuries. On a late night talk show, he claimed to have been stabbed more than 20 times, even though the physicians who examined him found no such thing. And there's actually, it's kind of weird because supposedly there was conflicting testimony from physicians some said he was some said he wasn't so again i don't know what to make of that yeah that's a tough one and again if he is a narcissist and he just wanted to say that even if he's innocent a, a narcissist psycho would obviously make something like that up jeffrey was a liar the stories he told his wife about going to russia 
and the stories he told his in-laws about killing one of the murderers were absolute whoppers. Not every liar is a murderer, but in my experience, every murderer is a liar. That's actually not true. There are some very, very principled killers who are not liars. So that's, uh, that's I mean, probably the vast minority. I'm not suggesting there's a lot, but there are some. Part of being a, a psychopath is having your own principles. Now, obviously, most psychopaths do not have the uh, the principle of not lying, but there are some, supposedly, that would never, at least they haven't been caught lying, where that's just one of their things. Just like some serial killers, whatever, they would never harm women and children. They only kill men. Other serial killers, whatever, they only want to kill women. They have their, however they operate, and they stick to it. And if they're very, very disciplined psychopaths, they would always stick to it. But again, here... Do we know that he really didn't kill one of the murderers? Like, is that... Because if one of them is unaccounted for... Because if there were five... Or even, do we know when the, the, the identified cult members... The, one, of, one of the white guys and the black guy... Do we know when they died? Does that line up with when he said he killed one of them? Because has that actually been tracked down? Like, is it definitive that he lied about that? Now, again, if he lied about to his wife about all these other things, again, how many men lie to their wives? How many wives lie to their husbands? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just so astronomical. Obviously, that doesn't really point to, to innocence or guilt. Okay, continuing on here, the facts that point to the intruders. McDonald may have cheated on and lied to his wife, but there was never any suggestion of physical abuse until he was accused of their murder i'm actually not even 100 percent. that was oh until the accused of the murder then the previous allegate okay maybe mcdonald gave a very specific description of the female intruder and officer mike who saw a woman who matched that description within two blocks of the murder scene it was almost 4 a.m and raining at the time so it was really an unusual place for a person to be let alone someone matching the description of a nearby crime Helena Stokely owned a blonde wig, floppy hat, and boots that were consistent with the description McDonald gave of the intruder. She confessed to at least a half a dozen people and that she was present for the murders and told many others that she was so high in mescaline and LSD that she did not know if she was involved with the murders. Stokely seemed to know about the broken rocking horse in the McDonald house, a detail that was not public knowledge. And that is also kind of weird because apparently they were doing financially well at the time. I mean, he bought a, ho he bought a real horse for his kids that he went, they went and fed that horse before the crime, but he couldn't afford to replace this one. So did the spring bring break relatively recently? So he just didn't get a chance to buy a new rocking horse. But either way, that's that's a weird detail. Dark wool fibers were found on the club that was used in the murders, but the fibers could not be matched to anything else in the McDonald home. At least two unrelated witnesses claimed that Stokely's ex-boyfriend, who was with her on the night the McDonald's were murdered, made incriminating statements about the murders over the years. A blonde synthetic fiber was found in Colette's hairbrush that could be, couldn't be matched to any wigs owned by Colette. Prosecutors argued that it came from one of the girl's dolls, but a doll expert pointed out to Morris that the length of the fiber made it extremely unlikely. And also, why... Didn't the girls have their own hairbrushes? Why would they use Colette's hairbrush to brush their doll's hair? I actually originally, yeah, I don't, I, I don't remember that detail. I knew that it was caught in the hairbrush. I was kind of assuming it was a random hairbrush in the house. But if it was specifically Colette's, that makes it even more or less, even less, yeah, a lot less likely. But why, I mean, why would there be a hair there anyway? I mean, I don't know. Again, none of this really makes any sense. Wax drippings were found in two rooms that couldn't be matched to any candles in the McDonald's home. There were fingerprints from an unknown person on Colette's jewelry box. And Jeffrey McDonald claimed the two rings were stolen. So wait a second. So they checked all of the investigators' fingerprints and this unknown fingerprint did not match the investigators who responded or any of the family. That's curious as well. Jeffrey was a free man for nine years between the Army hearing and his conviction in federal court. He was never accused of another violent crime that entire time. That's an interesting point. I don't know if anybody brought that up yet. A short hair from an unknown source that definitely did not come from any of the McDonald's was found in evidence obtained from under Colette McDonald's fingernail. See, I find that a lot more damning because, like, what's the allegation here that, well, again, if, if, well, if Stokely's that high on drugs, maybe she would brush her wig with Colette's hairbrush. I guess that's not that, 
Yeah, I mean, if this was like, yeah, if it was one of the males, if there was never a female claimed at the scene, I guess, yeah, if there was never a, ma- a, a female claimed at the scene, let alone part of some kind of cult on drugs, chanting with candles, then it would be much easier to completely write off the blonde synthetic fiber. And of course, the wig was blonde, so... Yeah, kind of weird. But the the hair from under Colette's fingernails is definitely curious. Because how did that get there? If someone wants to claim contamination, that's fine. But again, all of the other evidence here is, I mean, this is insane. The conclusion. I have to admit, I'm a lot more conflicted about this than I thought I was going to be. When I first read Jeffrey's version of events, I assumed it was an open and shut case. That seems like a completely fabricated story. And that's the thing I brought up in episode one. Just the, the outlandish nature of the story. Like, what kind of intelligent doctor would come up with that outlandish and ludicrous of a story? I mean, it's just so weird. But anyway, continuing on here, in February of 2001, I was certain that planes were going to be flying into skyscrapers all the time from that point forward. What? Thankfully, that wasn't the case. I am sure that in February 1970, it seemed like random attacks from murderous hippie cults were going to be normal. Thankfully, they never were. Jeffrey McDonald's story feels like a fictional account that seemed believable at a very specific moment in history, but that did not withstand the scrutiny of time. I see it the other way around. That seems completely unbelievable, even for the time. After reviewing all the evidence, though, I am much less certain. The case against Jeffrey McDonald has serious problems that can't all be explained away. So who do we think killed Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen McDonald? Well, we might disagree on this one, but I still think Jeffrey McDonald murdered his family. Let me speculate recklessly about what happened, and then you can tell me why I'm wrong. I think that Jeffrey McDonald was under a great deal of stress in February 1970. He worked three jobs, army doctor, emergency room doctor, physician for the boxing team, got very little sleep, and had a pregnant wife, two young daughters, and a horse to take care of. In McGinnis's book, Jeffrey devotes an uncomfortable amount of time describing his various romantic conquests before and after Colette. It seemed really important to him that he was always had a beautiful woman on his arm. Colette was a beautiful woman, but she was also pregnant with their third child. Despite his protestations to the contrary, Jeffrey McDonald cheated on Colette more than once, and that is not something a happily married man does. Well, actually, some would argue that the reason some men are happily married is because they're also getting so much extra on the side that they're just happy in general. Jeffrey married Colette when they were 19, and I think by 1970 he was starting to feel trapped. Again, there's countless men who have affairs. That I don't see how that points to murder. I mean, all, maybe all these other things do, but I don't see how that does. It's pretty common for people to feel trapped in a marriage at some point. Sometimes the feeling passes and they stay happily married. Sometimes it doesn't and they get divorced. But sometimes the suppressed frustration of a situation like that boils over into anger or violence. I think that's what happened with Jeffrey. I have no idea what the specific impetus was, but I think Jeffrey was sleep-deprived, stressed, and agitated the night of the murders. I think that after the girls went to bed, Jeffrey and Colette had an argument because they didn't want to wake the girls. They kept it quiet which explains why the neighbors didn't hear any fighting, but may have heard Colette speaking angrily. At some point, it became violent. Colette struck Jeffrey with the club, either out of anger or fear, causing the bump on his head. He snapped, took the club, and brutally attacked her. She tried to protect herself with a knife, nicking Jeffrey on the abdomen and arm, but he overpowered her and took the knife as well. He broke her arms with the club as she tried to protect herself. Then he stabbed her repeatedly with a knife after she stopped resisting. Okay, hold on a second here. Do we have character testimony on Colette? Because, again, this is 1970. If she's not like a drug-using drunk, like how many women in the 70s, in the 60s, early 70s, would, I mean, they might slap their husband, maybe. How many, and maybe even hit him with a club, whatever, maybe. I mean, that still seems doubtful. But how many would actually stab with a knife? I mean, I don't know. Again, every individual is unique, but on the surface, this does not seem believable. Even if he's guilty, this sequence of events does not seem believable to me. I mean, it just seems kind of weird. Especially since the murder, there were allegations that he had maybe slapped her or hit her before. So why would she just randomly start trying to stab him this time? 
I don't know. I mean, it just it doesn't really add up here. Again, even if he's completely guilty, even if he snapped and killed them all, just this sequence of her stabbing, I mean, wouldn't it seem more likely that he, he faked the injuries on himself? The attack either started in Kristen's room and moved to the master bedroom or started in the master bedroom, moved to Kristen's room, then moved back to the master bedroom to account for the large amount of Colette's blood in both rooms. Or does it seem more likely that, uh, that roving druggies are just stabbing and hitting everybody running from room to room and then back and forth again, just to the, the, just the amount of injuries? <sighs> Kristen was only two years old and was thus able to sleep through the fight, but Kimberly woke up at some point and went to the master bedroom. Jeffrey had already killed or was in the process of killing Colette. Jeffrey did not yet know what he was going to do after the murder, but he understood that his old life was definitely over and that he was never going to be able to be a father for Kimberly after what she'd seen. Well, I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, aren't there, aren't there quite a few accounts of fathers who've killed their significant other, their child knew about it, sometimes even witnessed it, but either never said anything, was traumatized, or was living in fear because obviously under threat. So I, I don't know if you would automatically assume that. So he struck her in the head with a club twice, knocking her unconscious, possibly killing her. He then carried her to her bed, where he stabbed her several times to ensure that she was dead. Mm. See, that's a problem, too. Like, even if his old life was old over, if he, unless this was a complete drug-induced snapping... It would seem that a father still wouldn't go to this level of excess. Like, if he wanted to kill his kid, it's just, it's so tough. Multiple weapons and stabs, I mean, and then switching hands to kind of fake it. I mean, I don't know. It just seems, it just, it, there's something off about it. I just, I don't see it playing out this way, given the available information. Even if he did kill them all, just this manner, it just doesn't seem like this is what would have happened. I think he then decided that he couldn't leave Kristen alive after what he'd done, so he went into the room and stabbed her to death. She awoke during the attack and raised her hands in defense, causing cuts to both hands. Well, why would she awake during the attack? Like, this is a grown man. If he wanted to kill a small child like this, there would be no waking up. Or if there was, there certainly wouldn't be any fighting back or raising hands for additional, to prevent additional injuries. I mean, one massive stab in the neck or one big blow to that, there's no fighting. This doesn't make any sense to me. And then why would he have decided that he couldn't leave her life? She didn't see anything. Yeah, it just, I mean, again, if this is some kind of drug-induced rage, whatever, he just turns into a family annihilator. But just the mechanics of it, it just seems, it's, something seems off here. There's missing pieces. Even if he's guilty, there's just missing pieces here. I like Paul Stombaugh's theory about the suitcase. I think Jeffrey McDonald's initial impulse was to pack a suitcase and head out on the run. He was going to leave the leave the country, change his name, change his appearance, and try to disappear. But he was a proud man who couldn't bear to live with the stain on his reputation. So that's an interesting point, because even if he's innocent, obviously he knew the number one suspicion would be on him. So would a narcissist, would he want to flee, or even a non-narcissist, if he thought nobody would believe him, would he try to, would he think about fleeing, even if he's innocent? So again, that doesn't really point to guilt. Just like in the Scott Peterson case, he's dyeing his hair and fleeing to Mexico. If he thought he was already convicted and he would never get a fair trial, why wouldn't he flee? Like, if he's innocent and he was 100% convinced he's not getting a fair trial, wouldn't a lot of people flee in that situation if they don't have faith in the system and they're facing life in prison? I mean, that's just that's just a, you know the fight-or-flight response. Like that, that doesn't point to guilt in any way. I th and look how many people w w didn't uh, didn't flee, and now they're sitting in, in prison because they had faith in the system, and the system failed them. So it's kind of hard to blame even innocent people who want to flee. I think at, that, at some point while he was weighing his options, he glanced out the window and saw a woman in a floppy hat. He recognized how weird it was that she was out there in the rain at the time of night. He assumed she was a hippie from town since there were a lot of them, and an idea formed. Could he convince everybody in his family... Could he convince everybody that his family was murdered by hippies? He staged the scene as best he could to... Really? As best he could? He couldn't even knock over a couple of books? Really? Really? I mean, come on. <laughs> 
He couldn't throw himself on the wall a couple times? I mean, really? He stabbed... <laughs> what? He stabbed his family's dead bodies with an ice pick and a second knife to give the appearance of multiple attackers, but he couldn't stage the scene better? He couldn't throw himself into a wall or a window a few times? <laughs> This, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. He wrote a message in blood, just like the Manson family had done, and then he gave himself a precise stab wound that would cause a serious sounding injury, a collapsed lung, that ultimately wouldn't be life-threatening. He then called the cops and did his best to sell the lie. Helena Stokely was not the woman in the floppy hat, but she fit the description. She was also a serious drug addict that could not account for her whereabouts during the murders. She was young and dramatic and kind of enjoyed... Well, this also doesn't factor in... If there's only the woman in the floppy hat, how did he also accurately describe two other guys there that Helena Stokely magically happened to hang out with? She was young and dramatic and kind of enjoyed the attention she was getting about her possible involvement in the case. She stoked that attention by making all kinds of incriminating statements to people in her life. But ultimately, she knew she wasn't there and was in no actual danger of being charged with the crime. I mean, that also doesn't jive with her last... That that might explain... Okay, if she's an attention seeker, whatever. She Maybe she said all these things, but why in the final visit to her mother does she say it again? And is it also just that coincidental that her boyfriend, druggy or not, I mean, he's making... I mean, yeah, this is all very, really weird. But ultimately, she knew she wasn't there and she was in no actual danger of being charged with the crime. And, and why would this... Why would a U.S. Marshal, Jimmy Britt, lie and say, and say he overheard Blackburn, who, again, later disbarred and served prison time for unethical practices? Why would a U.S. Marshal lie about this guy threatening Stokely to not say she was there if she really was going to testify? Man, this guy's this this reckless speculation guy doesn't seem to be that bright because he's kind of ignoring all these other factors. She got plenty of details wrong about the murder, but the bit about the broken rocking horse she either guessed correctly or overheard from all of the investigators who questioned her in the case. Well, without a timeline, because yeah, if an investigator said, "Did you know?" Why would they randomly say? Did you know there was a broken rocking horse in the room? I mean, that's such, that's kind of a weird, I mean, maybe, but that doesn't seem, I don't know how likely that could be. And again, also fooling Ted Gunderson and all of that. I mean, th this is just ignoring so much here. There you have it, a perfect salute, perfect, not even close. It accounts for almost a quarter of the evidence and only ignores the things that contradict it. <laughs> the hair under Colette's fingernail, you ask, why did Helena Stokely get rid of her wig and boots, you question. The wax drippings in the McDonald's home and the unidentified fingerprint on the jewelry box and the blonde synthetic fiber in Colette's brush, you demand. Not to be, not to be rude, but I asked when we started that you grant me a very loose definition of the word solve, and with that in mind, I'm calling this solved. Well, at least he, he admitted some of it. But he still didn't, again, between the, between the former U.S. Marshal, Brit, I mean, there's just so much here. And we didn't even get to one of the most mind-shocking things, which we're going to get to right now. There's actually two more, and they're, they're really insane. So, let's go through, this is crimearchives.net, directly from the 79 McDonald trial documents referring to this hearing, September 10th, 1970, First Lieutenant Edwin Casper. Colonel Rock states, this hearing will come to order. Let the record reflect that all parties present at the recess are currently in the hearing room. A conference telephone call was placed to First Lieutenant Edwin G. Casper II, who was sworn and testified as follows. Questions by Colonel Rock. Would you please give me your full name, your rank, your current military address? Okay, Edwin George Casper II, rank first lieutenant, military address, fourth officer student company, Fort Walters, Texas. Are you in the U.S. Army? Yes, sir. This afternoon, I'm going to ask you certain questions, and the following this counsel for the government, Captain Summers, and then the counsel for the accused, Mr. Siegel, may ask you questions. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Where were you stationed in February of this year? Fort Bragg, North Carolina, sir. And what was your resident address? Do you remember? It's 334 Nor North Doherty. And is that at Fort Bragg? Yes, sir. Were you home on the night of the 16th to the 17th, February 1970? Yes, sir. Approximately what time did you go to bed that evening? It was between 10 and 11, I think, probably right around 1030. 
Did your wife retire at the same time? No, sir. She stayed up and watched TV for a while. I see. Where was your bedroom that you were sleeping in located with reference to the street? Did it face the street? No, sir. Our bedroom is in the right front of the apartment. If you face the apartment and it faces the court inside of the court. I see. What were the weather conditions when you went to bed that night? If I remember correctly, it was raining sporadically off and on all night. All right. I forget whether it was raining when I went to bed or not, but I know it rained sometime during the night. Did you check to see whether any windows in that bedroom were open at the time that you went to sleep that evening? Yes, sir. We usually leave the window in all the rooms open because it's steam heated and it gets real hot and there's only one way we can regulate it to open the windows. There's no central heating. And then it is your impression that you had the window opening that evening. Yes, sir. Approximately how far open the window or the window had been open? Oh, probably just about all the way. It's not a crack. It's usually half or all the way up. That would be more than one window? That would be both windows. Right, sir. Were you awakened at any time during the night of the 16th to the 17th February after you had gone to bed? Yes, sir. Approximately when was that? I would say anywhere from, if I went to bed between 10 and 11, I would say between 12 or 2400 hours and 0300. 3 a.m. Why were you awakened? I heard... What I thought was the next door neighbor's kids running up the path and the splashing of the feet in the water awoke me. And I just rolled over and didn't think anything and went back to sleep. But my wife said, you know, later on when the CID agent came by and asked me if I had heard anything unusual, I mentioned this. And I said, of course, it was the kids next door. And my wife said, no, they had already moved. So then I didn't know who it could have been. Well, now would you repeat again what you thought you heard that evening? I just heard some some footsteps and laughing running through the water, that's all. It seemed like there was a group, that there was more than one, probably two or more, and they were running through the water because you could hear their footsteps splashing and they were laughing. And that's all I heard. I see. Were there any significant characteristics about the laughing that you noted? Did it appear to be giggling, a hearty chuckle, or could you describe it in any fashion? It seemed to me just occasional giggling, you know, ha 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 ha, something like that. I see. Do you remember whether anyone came to your apartment at any time during the daylight hours of the 17th to inquire about any unusual incidents? Right. The CID agents, two of them, stopped by. Let's see, it would have been late that evening, about 7 o'clock, I guess right at supper time, and they asked us if we had heard anything unusual, and at the time I did mention what we heard, you know, some young teenagers, what I thought were teenagers, running back and forth in front of the apartment, and of course it was probably just neighborhood kids next door. But then my wife said, no, they had already moved before this time. And I said, well, I don't know who it could have been then, but that's what we heard. Do you remember whether you indicated to the CID, CID agents approximately what time you thought you heard those? I think I did. I think they asked me about that. And do you recall your reply? No, not really. I don't know. I can't remember what I said. All right. Do you think, Lieutenant Casper, that your recollection of the events that evening is fresher now in your memory than it was on the date of the 17th of February? No, sir. It's not fresher because it's been a while. And I just, you know, just try to. The only thing I can remember is that they woke me up. And I usually go to bed between 10.30, between 10 and 11, that's all. Exactly what time they came by, I think it was between 2400 and 0300, because I was able to go back to sleep. If it had been like 4 or 5 in the morning, I'd be up because I have to get up at about 5.30 or 6. I probably went back to sleep, so that's all I can remember. Right. When the CID agents came to your door, did they ask you the questions or did they ask you and your wife questions, both of you separately, or just how did they ask the questions? Sir, I think they asked us both together. Together, And did your wife also volunteer answers? What's that, sir? Did your, did your wife also answer some of the questions? Yes, sir, she did. I think they asked me some questions and my wife came in and then, you know, they asked her approximately the same questions. Okay. Do you recall what answers your wife may have given to the questions or anything that may, she may have volunteered during the questioning? Well, I think my wife was, just from what I can remember, my wife was able to give them a little bit more, a little bit more info than I did because I think she said she had just gotten asleep or wasn't asleep yet where I was. They had woke me up, you know, and I just rolled over and went back to sleep. Colonel Rock states, I see. Thank you, Lieutenant Casper. I have no further questions. I will now turn you over to counsel for government for questions from his side. Just a moment. 
questions by Captain Summers. Can you hear me, Lieutenant Casper? Yes, sir. This is Captain Summers. You say what you heard sounded like somebody running through water and laughing. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Could you tell me from the voices if both male and female were present, or could you tell? No, sir. In all honesty, I, I don't really say I could tell because, I mean, I read the paper, and when I was at Fort Bragg, I know there was supposed to be two boys and a girl, and I could say, yes, there was two boys and maybe a girl, but I don't really know. I know there was laughing, and what I... Th Though I had a preconceived idea that it was the next door neighbor's girl and two of her friends that were boys. And I had this preconceived idea that it was so and so and her, new and her new boyfriend. But to actually say that they were, you know, male or female voices, no, I can't because in this instance, this neighborhood girl had already left. So I don't have any idea at all. And I hate to say who it was and wasn't. I just don't know. I just didn't pay any attention to it. You say you don't have any independent memory of recognizing which sex you were listening to, right, sir? I don't know. It was, it was, seemed to me, teenagers, because you could tell by the sound of the laughing, but whether it was all girls or all boys or one girl and two boys, two girls and one boy, I don't know, sir. I just didn't really pay that much attention at the time. Now, you use the phrase running back and forth. Could you clarify that? Which direction were these people running, if you could tell? And did they just run by once, or what do you mean by running back and forth? All right, sir. Our apartment faces a portion of the court that's between North Doherty and when we were there, Highway 87. No, what is that runs out in front? Route 80 that runs between... Are you talking about Bragg Boulevard? Right, okay, we lived between North Doherty and Bragg Boulevard, and the first time when I heard what seemed like they were running up from North Doherty toward Bragg Boulevard. The first time. And then it seems like they ran back the other way, like they were coming up towards the apartment and then running back down. What was the time interval between the first time and the second time? Half hour, maybe, I don't really know because I was half asleep. Wow, so we have an ear witness here. That is ear witnessing comings and goings that particular night. Okay, now as I understand it, you said they were running towards Bragg Boulevard when you first heard them. Right, sir. And then running back down towards North Darty when you heard them. Right, sir. When you were interviewed by the people you described as CID agents, could you have told them that you heard this at a period of time between 7.30 and 9 in the evening? I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I'm telling you, I remember all these questions were and what I remember saying. I might have. I thought that I had heard it earlier when I was downstairs reading the paper between that time because that's when I was downstairs reading the paper. Now, either I don't know, I can't remember what I really said. It's possible that you then might have said it was between 7.30 and 9. Right, but I don't know for sure because I was awoken that night between 2400 and 0300 because I remember I went to bed and I was awoken. Why did you think it was the teenagers from next door? Well, they usually would sometimes, you know, like on one weekend night, they would stay up pretty late and they would on a weekend, they would, you know, go over somebody's house to this girl's house that lived just down from us. And they'd sit around and talk and laugh and giggle for, you know, a couple hours or whatever. And they would do this, you know, and then they would go to somebody else's house. And this is why I thought it was them. Lieutenant Casper, do you have somebody else there with you right now? My family, are you conferring with someone as you answer these questions? Sir, my wife is trying to tell me what happened. You are not letting that affect you, are you? No, sir. Were there many children in that neighborhood? There weren't too many teenagers, sir. It was mostly now, just from what I remember, is that there was mostly younger children, like my, ch like my children, you know, between five and a couple of months. That's all that lived in our court, except for this one family. And if they moved, a family moved in there with just young children, too. Do you know the name of the family with teenage children? I don't remember, sir, at all. It was, I think it was a Spanish name, but I don't really remember. Okay, so what does everybody make of this? So did the wife corroborate that it was between midnight and 3 a.m.? But she stated there, those teenagers that he thought it was them, they had already moved by that point. Has that been corroborated? But either way, it kind of puts to bed, and if they hadn't moved, were they interviewed to determine whether there was anybody doing that at those times? But... This really kind of puts to bed the guilters who claim that nobody else heard or saw anything that night. Clearly they did. Now, exactly what it was and whether or not it proves that McDonald is innocent, obviously not. But clearly, clearly there is some damning testimony here. Now, let's get to one of the biggest mind shocks ever. So this is the testimony of one Jimmy Fryer. So supposedly Jimmy Fryer planned to call a man named Richard McDonald, 
But he was given the wrong phone number. So this is 2 a.m. And called Jeffrey's house instead. A woman answered the phone. When he asked Richard, when he asked for Richard, the woman began laughing. Another voice said, quote, hang up the damn phone, end quote. And the call disconnected. Helena also corroborated this, claiming that she was the woman that talked to Jimmy. So that's really curious because also the Fryer situation, some people said that he, he's a guy with mental issues, whatever, but it's, it's and, and so, so conveniently, these druggies, like if Helena Stokely, so she's got drug problems, whatever, she said that that did happen. She also knows about the broken spring. I mean, there's just so many questions here. I mean, what does everybody make of this? There's just so many mind-shocking so-called coincidences or anomalies. Like, how could there be this much? So conveniently, back in this time period, there are no phone records to corroborate this. Which, yeah, I mean, that's a problem. See, the thing that's crazy, like, let's say this happened in modern times. You'd be able to solve this easily because you would do all the DNA testing on everything. I mean, you'd obviously, people would have cell phones, you'd have the pings, whatever, and then all the phone records. So this could easily be corroborated, not to mention security cameras all over the place. But if he's innocent and this really did happen, I mean, yeah, this, this is rough. Supposedly long distance calls were logged, but non-long distance call, local calls were not. So the full story here is supposedly Fryer was hospitalized at Fort Bragg, left without permission. So he would have technically been AWOL. So then he wanted to report this to his doctor. His doctor was McDonald, but not Jeffrey McDonald. It was M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. But the hospital switchboard gave him M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D's number instead. And then when Fryer realized what had occurred after he had found out about the murders, he reported it. But nobody seemed to care because he had, you know, supposedly has mental issues or whatnot. Nobody cared. But, I mean, regardless of, of possible issues he could have had, if it's true, and Stokely said this did happen. So what does everybody make of this, including the witness account? And supposedly there's reference to yet, I don't know, I don't know if this was a mistaken reference to the ear witness, to Casper, but there, suppose, there might have been another witness who also saw people, but I don't see that. Uh, I can't nail that down anywhere. So maybe it was just the one ear witness. But still, I mean, it's just really weird. All of this is just so weird. So what do all the Mind Shock listeners think of this? I'll also be doing an AI analysis on this case because that will be very interesting to see what AI determines. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Hope everybody found another edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative. If you want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunks of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.